All right, so thanks so much everyone for coming. Um, it was exactly almost seven years ago to the day that we started uh, Science on Tap here at Blondie. Seven years ago. And so, um, yeah, this is, your, I guess, our eighth season, so it's really exciting. So I'd like to make a big round of applause, and uh, let's thank Blondies for putting up with us every month. Um, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Be sure to check your survey as well, okay? And, um, so we've been doing this every month when school's in session at HSU, so um, September through December, and February through May of uh, every year. And um, we have a different scientist presenting something. Um, and let's see, this is mm. December, so next Science on Tap will be uh, in February. In February will be John Steele, maybe some of you know who John Steele is. He's in the biology department in Humboldt State, and he studies the uh, gene editing tool of CRISPRs, which is a very uh, hot topic right now. And so that'll be on February 6th, because we do the first Wednesday of every month, okay? So um, put it on your calendars. We have a Facebook page. Um, that's our primary mode of communicating um, our events. So you can follow us on Facebook um, uh, there. But for tonight, i um, super excited to have our excellent presenter, Michael Furness. And to introduce Michael, I'm going to turn it over to Chris Harmon, who's my co-host here. And um, or we're both mutual co-hosts. And I'll turn it over to Chris uh, from Chemistry to introduce Michael. So thanks again for coming, everybody. This is awesome. wonderful things for the community. Uh, so as Cindy said, uh, my name is Chris Harmon. I'm a professor in the chemistry department where I do research in climate change and atmospheric chemistry. So it is my pleasure to introduce Michael tonight and be a part of this talk. Michael did his undergraduate and graduate degrees at UC Berkeley, a place that's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, he currently serves as the advisory chair to the, I'm going to get this wrong, the Redwood uh, Community Forest something, something, something advisory board. <laughs> I've gotten all those I, can, I took notes here terribly. Uh, Michael is also a hydrologist and climate adaptation scientist. Uh, he's retired from the U.S. Forest Service and Redwood Science Labs in Arcata. Um, but since retiring, uh, he has consulted, developed curricula, and taught nationally and internationally for about a decade. Um, he has consulted in 16 different countries. Most recently, he's come back from the Congo, uh, where he was there for a few weeks, working with the United States government and the local governments there. Uh, most notably, he also spent some time in Vietnam. Uh, if you're not Facebook friends with Michael, I would really suggest doing that. Uh, he posts the best stuff. In fact, I'm usually late to my classes because I'm looking at all of his posts. <laughs> like this. Uh, and Michael has also uh, been a lecturer at HSU in engineering and forestry. So, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Michael Furness. Let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Chris. I have to say, HSU has the coolest professors. <laughs> and so, hats off to. Is that a climate joke? <laughs> Cindy Hall in the physics department and Chris Harmon in the chemistry department uh, for this innovative uh, science with beer. Yeah. 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 Beers with beers. The wine. So I've done a lot of teaching in climate change and most of my lectures are unrelenting bummers. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you, you go on and you keep describing it, it's like, actually, it's worse than you thought. And the answer, here's this impact you haven't thought of. And it's worse than we thought, and it's getting worse faster than we thought. And da, 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 it's, it's really, and you, and you watch the faces kind of drop and the despair build. And, um, but there's this thing I've been noticing uh, for a number of years uh, that I wanted to sort of put the story together. And uh, we seem to be kind of a climate refuge here. Uh, and there's some flies in the ornament, uh, for sure. Um, 
And I don't really have a, a great rosy story for you because I think we all think globally now, and far be it from me to suggest that climate change uh, is not something that we need to be terribly concerned about and take action on. Um, and in fact, it's really in the news lately with the release of the fourth USA assessment. Um, the 24th uh, Committee of Parties is going on right now in Poland the UN Triple, uh, Triple C uh, group that meets every year about climate change, that's happening now in Poland. And there's a bunch of media hype about all of this stuff. So uh, uh, this, is, this is timely. And um, this really is a, a serious and dire and existential threat. Um, it's slow, but it's really inexorable as the greenhouse gases uh, keep increasing. And so the degree to which this is a refuge here is kind of a relative thing. Um, it's like, yeah, I got hit by a truck, but at least I didn't get hit by a meteorite. Yeah. <laughs> or, uh, yeah, I got the flu, but at least I didn't get the bubonic plague. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's not like everything is rosy uh, and we're just completely okay here. We're not. Um, but I've noticed that um, if you look at this area and the West, uh, West Coast, sort of San Francisco north uh, through Washington, uh, although there are some special things about our area. Um, it's basically, uh, it is a kind of refuge. It's, it's going to be, uh, I'm going to try and develop that story for you. So here's basic climate science 101. Uh, it's warming. Uh, in the last 250 years, the land has warmed about a degree and a half centigrade. You know, that's not a lot, but we see the evidence of it basically everywhere. And uh, heat and temperature are determinative for so many things, pretty much everything physical and biological. And the evidence of this rapid warming is just everywhere. Um, and the, the natural climate cycle for the past million years, they consist of long periods of glaciation or short interglacial uh, warm periods. And they're now one of those warm periods. Yeah, the mic. Your mic, Jack. Hold on one second. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Yeah. yeah. That's better. Yeah. Yeah, the physicist does a roadie here. I'm on a band, so it's okay. So it's one of those warm periods now, one of those relatively rare warm periods. And we don't expect the natural cycles at this point to contribute uh, significantly to further warming. And uh, it's us. Uh, so the humans have taken over. The human-caused increase in CO2 in the last two centuries has led to this uh, degree and a half rise in, in temperatures, in land temperatures. Uh, and we can expect that CO2 increases from human burning of fossil fuels uh, will increase the global average temperature another degree and a half or more uh, in the next 50 to 100 years. Um, and we're sure. Um, this is now unequivocal and has been since kind of the mid to late 90s. Um, and it's not the sun, it's not volcanoes, it's not cosmic rays, it's not natural. And there are whole multiple lines of evidence that show this, multiple independent lines of evidence that show this to be true. Okay? That one's not, is that, that's not looking as well. How about now? Hello, okay. Is that okay? It's good. Is it? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Sorry about okay. that. Okay. Uh, so we're sure about that. And um, it's bad. Um, and it's not really that much yet. You can see the evidence everywhere, but it's a relatively small change that we've seen so far. But what's bad about it is the trend and where it's going. And we can see where it's going. And that's really cool. Although cool might not be the right word to use. Um, and it's going to get worse and worse, and that's also unequivocal. And it's going to be worse for our kids, and it'll be worse for their kids, and it'll be worse for their kids. Uh, and we can fix it. There's reasons to be hopeful. And there's some very good reasons to be hopeful, and good reasons to be hopeful about our area in terms of adapting to the changes that we will see here. Um, I shouldn't have to do this, but I wanted to. Uh, there's this uh, denial industry that's gotten going. So if, if, if you had $33 trillion worth of assets, and a lot of people in the world were telling you you shouldn't dig them up and sell them, you might be motivated to do whatever you could to try to counter that idea. Uh, and that's what's happened. Uh, 
And it's it's something to perceive. I mean, we have a whole political party in the U.S. that if you're a good member of it, you have to deny the science, which is as good as it ever gets, really. Uh, so it's an amazing thing. The state of California put this list together of the organizations, the scientific organizations. That is an organization that only has their reputation. That's all they have. That's why they exist. Um, that hold that uh, climate change has been caused by human action. I'm not going to read all these, but you know you can pick off your favorite one. American Meteorological Society. Yeah, what do they know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and here's another GSA, list of the uh, American Society of Civil Engineers, GSA. Ecological oh, nice. Society of America, um, Geologically Society of Australia. The list goes on and on. Um, yeah. I'll note that the uh, American Geophysical Union, nice. Jay, uh, is also on this list, of course, the Society of American Foresters, the American Medical Association, uh, the National Academy of Sciences of Armenia, on and on and on. <laughs> <laughs> Including the uh, Zimbabwe Academy 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 So if, if you're uh, having a nice discussion with somebody who's denying climate change, you might ask them if they have any reputable scientific organizations who agree with them. <laughs> and you'll hear crickets. My brother-in-law. Uh, and Fox News doesn't count. Uh, and so what happens, you don't actually need to propose an alternative theory here. You just have the Harlan Institute. The Harlan Institute is not a scientific organization. Exactly. Uh, it's a sort of professional advocacy organization that lies. <laughs> yeah, they specialize in lies. And they, they fit, now that the fourth climate assessment is out for the USA, they've sent people, they've fanned out to the media uh, all over the place. And there was a, there's a gal in one of the uh, media outlets, and she says, well, I'm not a scientist, but I can tell you that the Earth is cooling. <laughs> and it's like, it's black is white and up is down. And, and, and to say the Earth is cooling is just like, it's completely opposite of all the observations in, in the scientific consensus. It's just kind of crazy. So um, people are offering folks something, one more thing that they don't need to worry about. And many people will take that and he goes, yeah, I'll accept that. I have enough to worry about. Or I'm confused by it. The climate and weather are confusing, and people turn away from things that are confusing. So all you have to do is confuse them. You don't have to come up with an alternative theory. And it's, uh, it's galling, and it's frustrating, and that's what we live in. Um, it's an American thing. The Canadians have picked it up a little bit, the Australians, but it's an American thing. You go to other parts of the world, and they don't have this. They accept it and are looking to what they're going to do about it. So don't sit for lies about this. Uh, be respectful, but don't ex accept falsity. And I, I tell my students that, and you know, uh, if somebody says this is a big hoax or isn't true or it's all exaggerated, please challenge that, okay? Because there is there is kind of a, a battle of ideas going on here, and we need to engage that, and not just shrug it off. So, and the last one of that is, uh, is NASA. You like NASA? Who doesn't love NASA? <laughs> so these guys sent a Juno probe to Jupiter, and it traveled uh, 1.7 billion miles over 4.9 years, and they predicted when it was gonna get there right after it took off, and it arrived within one second of the predicted time. Wow. <laughs> you know, NASA tends to get things right. And they just landed an 800-pound geotechnical robot on a planet that's spinning at 54,000, uh, orbiting at 54,000 miles an hour. So, you know. Go inside. <laughs> yeah, go inside. It's just amazing. So, NASA confirms that humans are causing the rapid warming that we observe all over the world. So, if your brother in law says, I don't believe this, is that why you're smarter than NASA? How many robots have you landed on Mars? Like? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, this is. Uh, a very important concept, yeah. and you probably all know this, but this is the difference between weather and climate. And weather is highly variable and kind of bounces around in a particular envelope uh, of variability, and the climate change is what happens over a long period of time. And so it takes a while to discern climate change. And in fact, the warnings about climate change came 50 plus years ago. And then it took 30, 40, it took a few decades to actually say, yep, sure enough, this is happening, and to figure out why it's happening. Uh, 
Um, now, what this graph doesn't show is a change in variability. And that's something we worry about. It's something we don't really get from the climate models. Um, and detecting variability of variability is, is quite challenging. Uh, the physics of climate change suggests that this will happen. We don't see it uh, unequivocally yet, but it will probably happen. It's one of the things that uh, is uncertain about all this. And when you look at the predictions, uh, it is important to understand the quality of the predictions and the differences between different types of predictions. And there's at least four key strains of uncertainty. First of all, we don't know how much greenhouse gas and aerosol is going to be emitted by humans uh, in the next century. We just don't know if we'll get it together or we'll just continue with the carbon party and uh, uh, you know uh, make things bad. So that is just unknowable. And we can be hopeful about it or we can plan for the worst, but we don't know what it's going to be. Uh, and then there's changes in climate variability and extremes. Again, we don't really get these from the models. It's not something we can push out of science right now. Um, but the physics of climate change uh, shows that we'll, we'll probably get big changes in variability and big changes in extremes. We just can't quantify them at this point. There's always climate model errors, and then there's natural variability in the Earth system. Uh, so radiative physics of the atmosphere is complicated enough, but it's not that complicated compared to the overall Earth climate system is, is wildly complicated. And there's some things that we don't understand or can't predict very well and maybe we'll never be able to predict. Uh, so long-lived oscillations like El Nino and the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, uh, random climate wandering from butterfly-type effects, volcanic activity, uh, and nonlinear tipping points. Uh, so it is worth noting that in the media, there's uh, a number of, uh, you'll see a number of stories that say, well, the whole earth is going to like tilt in the next five years and everything is going to shit. And that's uh, very unlikely. Okay? <laughs> Climate change is a slow, gradual process. Uh, so you don't need to worry about, you know, five years from now, we're going to be living in an absolute climatic hellscape. That, very unlikely. However, there are these tipping points of nonlinear processes. We're very good with linear processes and predicting things uh, from uh, linear that are linear. But a lot of nonlinear processes and processes that we haven't seen before and we don't understand very well, like the breakup of the ice sheet in Antarctica, um, or the methane hydrates in the ocean or the melting of the permafrost and the release of methane from that. And we don't know where these tipping points are. And there could very well be tipping points where everything changes very quickly. And so that's what keeps the climate scientists and the, uh, maybe many of you up kind of at night worrying about what <laughs> might happen. Unlikely we'll hit any of these tipping points in five years or even 20 years. Uh, but those tipping points are there and we don't really know where they are and we don't know how vigorous they're going to be. So that's there. So California. Yeah. California has it bad. This is just a, this is a map of uh, groundwater depletion. Um, but overall, California is um, not at all a refuge, not at all a great place for uh, writing out climate change. Um, we have a hot, dry summer. We're subject to very long, deep, dry droughts, wildfire, we all know about that lately. Um, we have very vulnerable warm snow that can easily change to rain and melts easily. And we have tremendous population pressure in California. So California itself is not a refuge. And there's a fly in the ointment. And I'm sure you've thought about this, or this occurred to you when you read the abstract. It's like, yeah, well, what about sea level rise? And this has been in the news, and uh, there's been a lot of work I've done on this in our area just recently. Some very, very good work. Um, and so this is the fly in the ointment. Or maybe it's like a velociraptor in the ointment. <laughs> <laughs> and we're coastal, and like all the coasts of the world, uh, we're seeing the impact of this, and it's very serious. Um, however, the way to adapt to this is to understand the vulnerability, and we're in great shape here uh, because of the efforts of Alderon Laird and Jeff Anderson and a number of other HSU alumni. Um, 
we're in really good shape here as far as understanding uh, what will happen here, what's vulnerable, what's not, uh, what could be lost, and how we might move ahead. Uh, I'm going to circle back around on this one after I develop the, uh, the Refugia story uh, and, and talk more about it because the, the sea level rise is a passion of mine as well. So first of all, temperature. What about temperature? And this is really the big one. That's why they call it global warming. <laughs> and here's the trend, uh, or here's the data, the observational data for the land and ocean uh, since uh, 1850. And when you include the ocean, it's about one degree centigrade uh, over that time period. And you can see this, uh, I have a stick. Don't fall asleep, I have a stick. <laughs> you can see this tremendous slope here. This is very rapid warming. And we know now that this is all, basically all end over again. This is not natural warming. And then this is the land function. This is uh, what's happened since 1750 in uh, land temperature. And this is the uh, degree and a half centigrade. This is from the wonderful uh, berkeleyearth.org, the Berkeley Earth Surface Temperature Project that Professor Muller and his daughter have been running. Really great. And uh, he's a climate skeptic, but not the kind of skeptic that denies the science. Just the kind that said, you gotta prove it to me before I'll accept it. So. Uh, I recommend him, even though he can piss you off sometimes. <laughs> so here's North America uh, observations. <clears throat> these are not modeled results. These are observations. These are data. So there's nothing uh, ambiguous about this. Or you know, models do have a lot of uh, uncertainty around them. There are a lot of different models that give you different results. These are not models. These are observational data. <clears throat> and this is the North America. This is California, and notice that the slope here is quite a bit less than the North American slope. And then we've done some interpolation, and here's for the Arcata Eureka Fortuna area, and notice this slope here, and it's even quite a lot less than California. And it turns out the reason California is less than North America is because the coastal area is included. Uh, and basically, uh, story more than anything that I'm going to develop for you has to do with coastal proximity. That we have a monstrous cold ocean right next to us here. And it makes a huge, huge difference. And we don't really expect that to change much. Uh, so here it is. North America is warming quickly, California less quickly, but it's because the coastal areas are highly buffered for temperature. And this is the current average summer temperature. And uh, like burr. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, yeah. Yay! Yeah. Yeah. Doing a little warming here, huh? Especially lately. Great summer day today. Yeah. 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 I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't. I don't. I like the idea of warming. Today was warm. Yeah. 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 Warm and then we've got this crazy ass hot valley here. Yeah. And then here's the projections for 2090. Yay! Yay! I mean, this looks like it's on fire, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Might be. And then, no, yeah. it's still cool out here. It's still cool along the coast. But this is not where people live, for the most part. I live there. You know, you, yeah. you drive the coast of Northern California and Oregon, Washington, there's, there's just these little towns. You know, Coos Bay. It's not San Francisco. Arcadia. Yeah, Arcadia. What's the red Yeah, we can't yeah, what's the numbers. One million okay. degrees. Uh, 100, 200. 10, 120, 130. What's the top? Can you interpolate? Yeah, you go from 90. I'm sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll check that out. Okay, the, yeah. the yellow is 100. It'll, it'll cost you beer to get that value. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get you a warm one. Are those fives or tens? <laughs> warm beer? And so here's another uh, oh, here graphic of the change. Uh, and then here's yet another. And so do you see a coastal effect there? Um, so when it's four degrees centigrade warmer in Salt Lake City, it may be something like a half a degree centigrade warmer here. Uh, and that is a very, very distinct effect. And what about heat waves? Well, they should be minor uh, and not of really high consequence here. 
because what passes for a heat wave here, you know, it's like 80 degrees, maybe. 70, 70, miserable. It's, it's 75 and everybody's complaining about a lot of it. You know, uh, and so if we have uh, a heat wave uh, because of climate change that goes up to 85, it's not going to be the kind of heat wave that kills people and, uh, uh, and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. Whereas if, if you're ready and if your, your peak summer temperature is 117 or 118 oh, yeah. and that goes to 122, yeah. right. you won't even be able to drive on the roads, they'll be melted. Yeah. Uh, and people will be dying from heat waves. So heat waves is a major uh, public health threat um, and it's a really big impact from climate change. We're already feeling that in a bunch of places uh, and it results in lots of deaths. Fires. Probably not a big deal here because of this huge temperature buffering effect that we have. Um, yes. And then we have a soil temperature regime that's called isomesic. And mesic kind of means sort of middle of the road. So. And the iso means it doesn't even change much. And uh, the iso part means uh, it doesn't change more than 5 degrees centigrade at 50 cent centimeters down. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we have this very big flywheel buffer in our soil temperature. Uh, and that's a significant factor, and that's because we're near the coast. And then the, one of the things that's observed everywhere is that the greater the elevation, the greater the temperature change. And it's actually not well understood why this happens, but the observations can confirm this every way you look. And we have mountains, but they're relatively low on the coast. So we don't have the big high mountains that we have say in Trinity County or all through the Sierras and Atchafies and that. Uh, and so we won't see that uh, tremendous warming effect that the high elevations have. Okay, so what about precipitation and drought? Um, so overall, um, there'll be more precipitation, more rain and um, maybe even more snow over the globe. Uh, but the spatial dif uh, di distribution of that differs greatly from place to place. And we know that for every degree rise, one degree centigrade rise in global average temperature, that the atmosphere holds 7% more water. Okay, that's a big number. And so were we to go up three degrees centigrade global average temperature, with a three times seven, I am doing 21. That's a lot, that's an enormous change. And that results in an overall increase in precipitation globally. Um, and basically, uh, changes in temperature are pretty easy relative to changes in precipitation. Precipitation is a complex process, it's a threshold process, it's hard to predict. And the projections for changes in precipitation are all over the place. Uh, and for any given place, uh, in the middle latitudes, they tend to, they, even, the, even the sign of the change, it, it don't agree between the models. Uh, the sign of the change in temperature, they all agree. Um, but precipitation is hard. So you might have noticed that the, the weatherman is almost always right on temperature and often wrong on precipitation. They will even bet you that they'll be within three degrees on temperature because it's easy. Uh, but not on precip. It's much more difficult to predict. As temperature rises and precip increases, cloud cover is also be expected to increase. So the models also model cloud increased cloud cover globally? In yes. Terms of um, clouds are difficult to model, right. and only the most recent models are tackling it. Uh, but they are a big factor, and they both warm and cool uh, the atmosphere. Uh, but they are including clouds. It's probably one of the big bugaboos for climate models is clouds. Uh, yeah, but it's, it's very dependent on uh, temperature and moisture. Um, so basically, our winter rainfall is projected. Now this is with a grain of salt because the projections are not very good uh, for more rain uh, and a little less rain in the fall, um, about even in the summer and a little uh, or, uh, let's see, about even in the spring, a little less, in the, uh, about even in the fall as well, uh, a little less. Um, so we may have a dry fall, dry spring, according to this, but a wetter winter. Where is, where is this in the future? 
this is a projected change. I'm sorry, it should show this is for 20, 2100. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I could show you lots of precipitation projections and none of them agree. Um, so here's another one, the change in spring precipitation. Spring is a big deal um, because it, it uh, uh, it's late in the season and has something to do with fire season and uh, plant stored water and that. Uh, but we see a little bit of a decrease uh, in spring precipitation and then all of all of the models do predict uh, that the southwest of the U.S. Um, will be bad. We'll see uh, much droughtier conditions. Uh, so it's a dry place that's getting drier, which is not good. But basically for us, it's very strong, small change predicted. And then this is an important factor. This is for the Pacific Northwest from the Climate Impacts Group at University of Washington. But the same thing applies to us here. And when you look at the projected changes relative to the range of variability that you see, um, in temperature, we're in a whole new world, okay? Massive change from uh, where we are now to where we expect to be. Whereas precipitation, even with the changes that we may ex expect, we're still well within the range of variability. And so the take home there is temperature matters, and temperatures, the projections are pretty good. Don't worry too much about precipitation uh, and the projections of precipitation. Now, the, the thing we do need to worry about is, is snow changing to land. And I'll, I'll get to it. Uh, and here's another projection. This is uh, the 30-year average uh, projected for 2084. And you can see we're in the area where there's little, uh, this is a little bit down, this is a little bit up. And when you're in this zone where it's a little bit this way or a little bit that way, it probably means there isn't going to be a lot of change, but it does mean that there may be some change in variability. But that's where we're at. We don't expect uh, huge changes in precipitation. And then when rain or snow falls uh, on the soil, um, it's fractionated. Uh, into two basic parts. You can make more parts if you want, but basically into green water and blue water. And the green water is the water that's held in the soil, in the soil reservoir against gravity, and is available for plant growth. Um, and some of it kind of slowly drips out over time, over the summer. And then there's the blue water that is excess to the green water and feeds the streams and rivers and, and, and the runoff, basically. Uh, and, and these are very important concepts. In terms of drought, you can have a blue water drought without a green water drought. Um, you can have, uh, you can't really have a green water drought without a blue water drought. Okay? And this is some uh, fractionation uh, graphic that we use teaching foresters in India. And uh, our proportions are probably more like half and half. It depends on how much rainfall it is, the kind of soils you have and whatnot. They're showing more green water than blue water here, but think of it as about half and half. And the green water, of course, does all this stuff in wetlands and forests and croplands, and basically it's the water that's held in the soil. It's a lot of water. And that's why we have forests and grasslands and plants that grow, uh, is because of the green water. And then the blue water is the stuff that feeds the streams and the rivers and that. Um, and basically, how much do we need to worry about drought here? And essentially, even in a dry year, we have enough water to fill up our soil reservoir. So our soils hold about two inches of water per foot. The rooting zone is maybe about six feet. And so we need about 12 inches of rainfall to fill the green water reservoir. And so even if we had, so we get 39 inches of rainfall in an average year, even if we had 30% of that, we would have enough to fill up the green water reservoir. Now we would have a severe blue water drought, and the streams would be going dry, and the fish would be gasping. Uh, so the blue water story is not so good, but the green water story is, you know, it'd have to be a hell of a drought to really have a bad green water situation. Uh, and this explains why we didn't see a lot of forest damage in the extended drought that we had, 2011 to 2015. 
Um, we didn't see, for example, uh, redwoods dying from drought, um, whereas th there was a lot of drought mortality in other parts of California. Um, Michael, does, does green water go into groundwater to some degree, or is it yeah. Well, the green water technically is never, never becomes, never is never exported. Okay. Uh, and groundwater is would be considered blue water. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and here's another flight in the arm. We can see serious blue water droughts uh, in terms of aquatic ecosystems um, if we have a drought that's related to higher temperatures or increased climate variability or just the kind of thing that simply happens in California. Long, extended, dry, crazy dry droughts. Um, we could see a lot of impacts on our aquatic ecosystems. And so I don't want to characterize that as uh, a refugia situation. Uh, this is, this is uh, something that can be pretty bad, and we saw it actually. We saw very low flows in our streams and rivers uh, in, in the last few years, and it was really hard on the fish. Uh, so that can happen. And uh, I don't want to paint that as, as a refuge situation. That's one of the areas where we would worry. And then snow. Uh, so this is, um, California is probably the most consequential area for this particular climate impact. And that is as temperature rises, more of the precipitation comes as rain than as snow. And the snow that does come melts faster. Uh, and then the, so the snowpack is uh, really at risk. And California has warm snow, you consider vulnerable snow. Um, it is, except at the highest elevations, it's close to zero when it snows. So it's a little below zero when it snows, but not very much, it wouldn't have to heat up very much and it turns into rain. And you know, if you go to Minnesota or Pennsylvania, that's cold snow and is much less vulnerable than the California snow. Mm -hmm. So it would have to warm up a lot to turn Minnesota snow into rain. But it doesn't have to warm up much to turn California snow into rain. And this is the projections for, this is the uh, soil water equivalent in April, uh, snow water equivalent rather, how much water, total water is in the snowpack. And 2030, 2060, and 2090, and I can tell you, this is freaking out the water district managers. Um, as many reservoirs as we have in California, still three quarters of our water storage for the summertime drought period is in the form of snowpack. And it's going away very quickly. All we would have left by this projection from Scripps is the highest elevations in the Southern Sierras. Um, and so I, I heard somebody give a talk about climate change in California, and he said, there'll be less snow, that's all you need to know. Um, and there's a truth to that, that really is the, a, a huge problem for California uh, and our tremendous water demand that we have in the summertime when it doesn't rain or snow at all. Um, and so this is a big deal. Um, and what about snow here? Well, this is uh, the recent snowpack just a week ago, and it doesn't snow here much. And when it does snow here, it doesn't last. We don't have much of a snowpack in our mountains. And some of our hydrographs on our larger rivers do have uh, a blue water component that it comes from snowpack. Uh, but it doesn't really, it's not a big number. Uh, not like a snow-dominated hydrograph. We have basically rainfall-dominated hydrographs, and there's a small snow component. And our water supply basically is not dependent on the snowpack. Uh, whereas in a lot of California it is. You lose the snowpack and you lose your water supply. Uh, unless you build more dams and that's not popular anymore. Uh, and so we don't depend on snow for our aquatic ecosystems for the most part. You know, Bill, Bill Trush isn't here. <laughs> I expect somebody to argue with me about this one, <laughs> and some others as well, but well, the treaty, basically we don't depend on snow here. We're not a snow region, we're a rain region. Uh, and that adds to our uh, the story about uh, this being a refuge here. 
Um, and then there's various maps of where water availability, be, availability for people in agriculture is going to be bad, and you notice yeah. not at all bad here. Yeah. Uh, terrible in the southwestern U.S., uh, but not up here where we are. Um, and then this is a, a map of California drying, basically a map of uh, soil water and groundwater that's been sensed by satellites. Uh, by gravity anomaly from satellite measurements. It's amazing that we can do this, but we can. And they can show groundwater depletion during the drought period. Uh, really, really interesting. And then, um, let's break kind of halfway here, and I'll take a couple questions, and then we'll have a break by beer, by sandwiches, and we'll reconvene in about 10 minutes and we'll continue to develop this story. And we'll also circle back to uh, sea level rise. These days, after having gone through just a hellish couple of years um, with devastating losses that um, I think we weren't, many of us, including me, who's worked at forestry forever, weren't really aware of what happened, or didn't really grok that you can lose whole towns, like Reading and Santa Rosa and Paradise and Magnolia, um, and all the other towns that haven't burned yet. Uh, so there's a lot of discussion about wildfire, there's going to be a lot of discussion in the coming year about wildfire. Um, and when you talk about increasing heat levels, increasing temperature levels, obviously that would influence wildfire uh, and its ability to get going and sustain and how it behaves uh, and how long our fire seasons will be, how severe the fires will be, how many fires we'll have, how much acreage is burned. And the picture is not rosy. Um, and so the data clearly show that we're having more wildfires uh, in recent decades and they're bigger. Now, there are many influences on this uh, besides temperature, so it's quite a complex story. Um, but even with all these wildfires, it's interesting to note that only about 11% of the western U.S. has burned since 1950. Uh, and so the frequency and size has increased, but the amount uh, that is burned isn't, isn't as much as you might think. Uh, and in this map, the private lands are purple, the public lands are not colored, and these orange areas are places that have burned since 1950. And, uh, and it turns out uh, it's a random distribution. So when we look at private lands versus public lands, there's no difference in fire occurrence. And so this thing that you hear a lot of people saying is like, we're having bad fires because we're not clear cutting the public lands anymore. That's bullshit. It isn't supported by the data, it isn't supported by the physics, it isn't supported by the forestry. Um, but there are some folks that sort of take advantage of a crisis and, 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 and say things that they've always wanted to say. You got a rake? It just isn't true. <laughs> got a rake? A rake? A rake, yeah, right. It turns out the worst thing you can do for soil productivity is to rake the forest yeah. floor off. <laughs> <laughs> the absolute worst. The only thing we've really been able to figure out about long-term soil productivity is crazy hard to research. Yeah. But if you remove the forest floor litter, yeah. Yeah. you deprive the soil of its food and uh, uh, the ecosystem of the very important component of the forest and the use productivity. So raking is a super bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> In an ocean of bad ideas, this one is the one hit me the worst. <laughs> also for its ridiculousness. But, uh, but anyway, this area shows the locations of repeated uh, fires, the areas have, that, that have reburned uh, since 1950. And it turns out a lot of areas uh, that burn, they burn again. And, you know, a decade or two goes by, the vegetation regrows, and it just burns again. And, we know that the, uh, the fire in Santa Rosa happened before uh, with almost the same footprint. Yeah. Oh, and the fires, the campfire, uh, burned almost a very similar footprints uh, in that same area. It happened to spare Paradise and Megalia and didn't this time. Uh, but these, these areas that burn tend to burn and reburn and reburn and reburn. 
Uh, and not just some stuff about fire, but here's the projected increase in the number of very large fire weeks. That is a week where the conditions are such that you can support really large fires, where it's really dry, the humidity is very low, uh, it tends to be windy, um, and this is a percentage increase. Uh, and you can see it's really bad. It's a really bad story. Uh, and uh, a friend of mine, uh, David Peterson, who's a great fire ecologist, uh, says by 2050 we will probably have something like 4x the amount of area burned because of increasing temperatures. So it's a, it's a terrible story, but here we are, sitting pretty yeah. again. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to tell you we're not, we don't have fires here. We do have fires here. We can have fires here. We could have a devastating fire here, but it's not at all likely relative uh, to these inland areas that are much, much hotter. What does that mean in terms of greenhouse gas emissions? Like all this yeah. stuff is burning. Yeah, that's a positive it's feedback so mechanism. Positive right. feedback. If it gets warmer, you have more fires, you have more carbon dioxide released, you have more warming, you have more fires. So there's a, a this is why uh, <laughs> climate science is not just the radiative physics of the atmosphere, it's how this all plays out in the earth climate in the earth system. And there are scores of positive and negative feedbacks. So there's more CO2, so plants grow faster. That's a negative feedback. Uh, and, and you go down, and, and a lot of those feedback mechanisms are not that well understood. There's a lot of research going on now to try and understand those, because you need that to properly anticipate what's going to happen. But, but anyway, the projected increase in fires is bad, and we should worry about that. And it will increase in California, uh, but really not so much here. What about flooding uh, and storm surge? So basically, um, we don't get hurricanes and tropical storms here. And this is where the flooding is really bad, and especially the coastal flooding. Uh, and you may have heard that in Superstorm Sandy that hit New York, uh, there was a storm surge of like 12, 13 feet. It was huge, enormous storm surge. But well, the storm surges we see here are like a foot or two, yeah. uh, if that. Yeah. Uh, and it's because we don't have those tropical storms that have this very long reach of wind blowing and push the ocean up like crazy. And so we don't have really bad pressure. storm surge. We don't have these big steeper tropical coast. storms. Steeper and steeper coast as well. And there is an expectation that um, There'll be additional um, atmospheric river type storms. Uh, large uh, flood producing storms will probably increase uh, in most places and will increase here. Uh, and so that is not a place where we think, oh, we're not having that either, you know. Uh, we will have that. Uh, but it is something that tends to happen in the valley bottoms and we can and ought to deal with it with uh, good land use planning um, and uh, zoning. And uh, we're sort of on top of that. <laughs> <laughs> Vote! Yeah, how many think we're all on top of a flood zoning? Uh, here's the prediction for tropical storm increases. Uh, so the, uh, the, the, the models and the observations basically show that we're, we're not having more hurricanes, but the larger, largest hurricanes get larger. So the really, the really destructive Category 5 hurricanes will become more frequent, even though the total hurt number of hurricanes uh, doesn't look like it will, or not in the, uh, in the next few decades anyway. Um, but it's really the big ones that we worry about and cause the most uh, destruction, obviously. Um, and you can see there's an increase uh, late 21st century, and this is present day. Uh, there's an increase uh, in the southern eastern Pacific, uh, but it doesn't make it up into California. Uh, and so there's a lot of worry globally about the increase in these storms, warmer ocean temperatures, more energy, bigger shit-kicking storms, um, but not here. And uh, the Gulf Coast, obviously, and the East Coast of the U.S. 
is where the water is really warm. You have these hurricane cyclonic systems and they're super vulnerable to these kinds of storms. Uh, and so it's, it's worse there uh, by far than here. And so what about fog? Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Fog so much. More That's fog. Live here. More fog. More fog. More fog. More fog. We love 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 fog. We fog. We love fog. We love fog. We love fog. We love uh, I don't think much, uh, but basically saying we can expect more fog here. Yay! Uh, isn't that fabulous? Colder summers. Yay! Isn't that great? Uh, <laughs> and there, there, was a, there were a couple paper, papers published. But not so far. Last it seems years, nicer. Yeah. 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 It, it depends on the data set we look at. And two summers ago was the most fog we've ever today. observed. Yeah. It's highly variable. Um, people think there's less fog. And there were a couple papers written. And there was a, a big publicity thing that went with them. And, you know, sometimes science by press release is problematic. And um, their conclusions about there being less fog from climate change, I was confused by the paper and I thought that their argument was really thin. And they never looked at smoke. The word smoke never even occurred in these two papers. And there was an enormous amount of smoke generated here. Uh, there was a time when you could stand at the top of 11th Street and see 75 TP burners that were going 24-7 and they were burning the clear-cut units. And it smoke, 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 smoke. And the smoke looks like fog and probably can yeah. even produce fog. And then, yeah, and then the, uh, <laughs> and then the smoke went away. Basically, the old growth party was over and the mills kind of collapsed into a very small number of mills and no smoke. Very, very huge decline in smoke. Uh, and so I think that's a real factor. And, um, but when you look at what drives fog, basically the ocean gets really cold here in the summer because of strong westerlies that develop because of the hot inland area and the cold ocean. And this produces an uprolling effect where the cold water comes from the, uh, down in the depths and makes a very cold surface. And if you're a surfer, you know it's butt cold in the summer. It's butt cold all the time, but it's especially cold in the summertime. Uh, and the differential between the coast temperature and the inland temperature is what drives the movement of the marine air in and basically brings our fog. And so you probably noticed the hotter it is in Reading, the more fog we'll tend to have here. And that's really that driver is that temperature difference. And that temperature difference is intensifying. And so it'll get hotter faster in red than it will here. And that should drive more fog. Which would also drive more upwelling and potentially coastal productivity, marine environment. Maybe. Hopefully. The ocean's a complicated place. Right, very complicated. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. And fog is a complicated phenomenon. This might be wrong. And it turns out there's some people from USGS uh, and a number of others that are really trying to dial down this fog issue. And so the, the, the conclusion isn't in, but my conclusion, and um, Troy Nicolini, the meteorologist uh, at the National Weather Service here, agrees with me. He says, yeah, I think you're right. There'll be more fog um, because of this basic mechanism. Um, and then it turns out, well, what if the ocean warms and then that differential will lessen? And it turns out the ocean's been cooling offshore here. Mm. It's, a, it's a mystery, but for the last 30 years, it's actually been getting cooler. So, um, <laughs> what about the blob? Yeah, so that's the right. variability from year to year. And this is, this is these are long-term trends. So, but yeah, there, there are things like the blob and a lot of things that we don't understand about the system that could throw the blob. My conclusions and everybody else are sure about the blob. It's a high pressure ridge. And I just threw this in. This is for the third <laughs> national assessment of the United now. States well, we're projected at changes in tick habitat. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> 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 
Everything we love more than fog is This is a real bummer uh, for, for Lyme's disease and the other things as well. And it's also true that the warmer temperatures are bringing in the mosquito that carries uh, Zika and Chikungunya uh, and other nasty diseases uh, into Florida, which we never had in the U.S. before, but now we do. So, Florida uh, deserves it. Um, <laughs> and I'd like to address this uh, question of redwood survival. Ah. And I am going out on the limb here, and I'm out of the oh. and I'm Better super land. nervous about it. Marie <laughs> Antoine and Lucy Corvillis are, are right here. Is it about that redwood bark beetle? Uh, <laughs> a couple of trees died from redwood, or were dying from redwood bark beetle in Redwood Park. They're projected uh, to die in 120 years. But basically, uh, redwoods are, are so bomber they don't have much problem with insects. Um, but here's my take on this, and others may have a different take. This is the most famous and arguably the most valued tree on Earth. Uh, I, anywhere I go in the world, I say, oh, from where the redwoods are. Oh, you're from the redwoods. Yeah, people know the redwoods uh, the world over. It's amazing. Uh, and, and they're so valuable, and we don't want to take a, any kind of a chance with them. Um, but we say, well, there's going to be less fog. Therefore, we're going to lose the redwoods. Well, probably not. There's probably going to be more fog. Um, and from what, from everything I can see, uh, many years redwoods basically need fog for their seedling survival. Their seedlings are really vulnerable to drought. Uh, they don't grow roots very fast, and they perish if they don't have good summer moisture. And so their range, their natural range, is controlled by fog. And so that's where we only find them in areas that are very foggy on the coast. Um, but if that range starts to contract, we can very easily do artificial regeneration. We know how to do that now uh, with planting seedlings or irrigating uh, and whatnot. Uh, in terms of the survival of the mature forest, um, it's not essential to have fog. It will survive okay without fog. I'm sure you've seen redwoods in Sacramento, where it's like crazy hot and it's really hot in the summer. And they, they can be just fine without fog, but they can't reproduce well uh, by seedling without fog. And so that's that's the critical thing. And uh, and I would say we'll probably get more fog. Um, the redwoods have been here on the coast for at least a million years. Um, and this is a hunch from, from Bob Van Pelt and others, um, but it seems very likely that they've, they've been here for at least a million years and probably much longer. Um, there are 200 million year old species. Um, they used to be distributed all over the place. There was uh, just recently a seed of coast redwood found in Redding that was uh, 80 plus million years old. Um, and so they're a very old vegetation type and a place where they would persist, even in times of uh, you know, very poor moisture, very low fog, very high temperatures, would be on the coast here. Um, and we've, we haven't been glaciated here. And when we go up to Washington, those forests were completely, the northern Washington were completely wiped out, and the Sierras were completely wiped out by glaciers. That didn't happen here. So we have a very, very old forest here. And if it's been here a million years, it's been through lots of different climates and lots of stressful climates, and it's still here. So that's a cool thing. Um, Steve Norman is a great uh, vegetation ecologist and did a lot of work in Redwood. He's in North Carolina now, but he said, you know, I guess I'd have to say this is one of the last species we worry about. There's a lot of forest species we worry about, but um, maybe not so much Redwood. Uh, and we don't see indications of a big impact so far. Um, but we don't want to take any chance with these. And the studies that we're doing um, with Humboldt State and Save the Redwoods League are, are very worthwhile and ongoing. Uh, so there's not to say we don't have anything to worry about with the redwoods. Uh, but if somebody comes along and says, climate change is going to wipe out the redwoods, eh, probably not true. Um, I, I have to add a caveat, though, and this is true about like, almost all of these impacts that if we have, if we go to two, two, three, even four degrees centigrade increase in global average temperature, 
a lot of these conclusions were hold. If it goes above that, mm -hmm. we go to five, six, seven, eight, all bets are off. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It turns into a complete shit show. Humanity must avoid these eight degrees, for example, or we just lose the Earth. Probably the redwoods too. I didn't either. There is a redwood bark beetle, and is it going to, you know, expand if we get hotter? These particular trees were covered with pavement and had ponded water most of the year, so yeah, it's uh, more yeah like I think that's the weakened. bark beetle. Weakened. Uh -huh. yeah. I think that's the bark beetle. Yeah. The bark beetle is the is the pavement in the water. Right. Yeah. 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 And then the beetles just kind of got in there opportunistic. If they exist. It's right. you know uh, redwood doesn't really have an insect problem. I've never right. heard of it. Most trees have an insect problem. Most trees have an insect or five that specialize in them uh, and are really hard on them and not redwood. Right. Yeah. So um, anyway, that. I really wanted to show up with some good news about this because it's, as you say, it's an unrelenting bummer. And uh, there is some good news for those of us who live here um, uh, about the, 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 the refuge quality of our area. And that, uh, I believe, and, and we, can ha we can have debates about this and the, the studies, uh, I, 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 I'm so happy that those are going on because we want to take no chances with this amazing forest and species. Um, but, uh, and then it, it may be a different story with the uh, Sierra and the giant redwood in the Sierras. Uh, it's a, it is a much different story because it's a much different climatic, set of climatic impacts. And I don't have a conclusion about that, but somebody might. Uh, so let's go to sea level rise. Um, and this has been a passion of mine. I've been a coastal guy for a long time. And I've worked in Southeast Asia where the impacts are insanely bad and are already manifesting in some really bad ways. Um, and then what happened here, this is an indication of what a cool place we live in. Um, some, some really uh, bright people stepped up and figured out the you know, land level elevation changes, the vertical changes in the uh, land, land, which we had to know. Um, and the vulnerability of Humboldt Bay, Humboldt Bay area. And so the first thing you do to adapt to climate change is, is a vulnerability assessment. And what's vulnerable, what's resilient, how can you change things that are vulnerable to be resilient? It's a knowledge exercise. And we've done that here. And we've done it as well as I've seen anywhere. Uh, so I thought Alderon would be here, but I don't think he made it. But Alderon Laird and Jeff Anderson, are really uh, preeminent guys in, in figuring this out, and it's all been published. Um, and there's lots of the, there's one for the city of Eureka, there's one for the city of Arcata, there's another one for Humboldt County. You know, I put in so on here because I couldn't put them all in there. Um, Jeff has done some amazing, he's just a really amazing, solid uh, environmental engineer, done some great modeling of how Humboldt Bay works and whatnot. Um, the engineering, uh, environmental engineering resource uh, department uh, at Humboldt State um, does a lot of work on this, uh, and so their capstone projects and, and senior projects and whatnot, they often take on the issue of sea level rise and produce some, some really great work uh, in terms of the impacts and how we might adapt. And so we're really in good shape in terms of understanding these impacts. Um, and I wanted to go into just a little bit of detail about how sea level works uh, for you uh, that maybe you should know. Um, so normally sea level changes quite, quite radically uh, uh, through time uh, as the, we shift from glacial periods to the interglacial periods. And the last ice maximum was about 20, 22,000 years ago. And since then, sea level has been rising really fast with some especially fast pulses that were related to uh, rapid melting of the ice sheets. And then about 7,000 years ago, it just stopped. And we've had, essentially, there's been some small changes, but we've basically had stable sea level for 7,000 years. And that's what we think is normal. Um, it's not actually normally, much more commonly the Earth is, you know, sea level is either rising or falling quickly. Uh, but we've had this 7,000 year period 
and it probably enabled civilization to develop yeah. because you could have coastal cities and you want your city to be coastal it has navigation and food and mild climate etc uh, didn't have to keep getting up and moving uh, so during this period uh, that's when there wasn't an Atlantis there must have been many many opposites that uh, set themselves up on the coast and then got inundated and then moved, and then got in and then moved. It's probably also the origin of the flood myths. Uh, but we think that we have a stable sea level, and that's basically over now. So the sea level rise is, is a basic, basically on about this kind of a slope now. And um, you could spend a whole um, college career on this one graph, but I'm going to move on. <laughs> so this is what sea level looks like. So 20,000 years ago, uh, it was 120 meters lower. And the beach was another 10 kilometers offshore. So we had a bunch of actually a 10 kilometer strip of redwood forest that's now gone, it's under mud. Uh, and uh, this is the present sea level. And then if all the ice melts, you get about this much more. Um, there's um, that much ice locked up in Antarctica and Greenland. It's actually 57 meters in Antarctica and 7 meters in Greenland. So Antarctica is really the big story. And we don't know how that will behave with rapid warming. But um, there's still a lot of water left uh, on the continents that isn't in the ocean yet. And just a quick primer on how sea level rise works. First of all, there's thermal expansion. As, it get, as the water gets warmer, it takes up more space, and so sea level rises. And then the melting and collapse of this terrestrial ice so adds water to the system and sea level rises. Um, but the other big part of the story is that the land level is not stable in most places, and it sure as hell isn't stable here. Uh, and we have things like asastasy, where um, there's a buoyant effect that can uh, cause land to rise or fall. There's tectonics, which is the big story here, sediment, land subsidence, which is a big story in many parts of the world, and so on. And this can go up or down. Um, and then you have things like El Nino, tides, storm surge, um, onshore currents, oh, that one's white, and wave height. <laughs> and it all kind of goes together to sort of a complex picture of how local sea level works. Um, but what you have to know in order to figure out the local, or what's called the relative sea level, is what's happening to the land level. Um, and this was recognized, uh, oh, and there's also uh, freshwater flooding that comes on top of that. So this is when you get the perfect storm, is when the, when the tides and the storm surge and the wave height uh, all come together and there's flooding as well. So um, it turns out, uh, as you all know, we're on the ring of fire here and we are a seismic area. All these areas are seismic and have uh, tectonic movements that are going on all the time. And uh, these are where the earthquakes happen. Uh, and this is a, a graphic I got from Jay here about what's happening. He could explain it better than me, but I guess this is my lecture. So. <laughs> uh, but this the Pacific plate is always moving uh, under the continental plate here. It never stops at about the speed of a fingernail growing. But most of the time it's stuck. Um, and because it's moving and stuck, that this land either goes up or down. It gets dragged down or it bulges up. And this is between earthquakes. And then when the earthquake happens, it moves all of a sudden, and again, it can go up or down when the earthquake happens. And we're sitting right here. Um, lovely. It's not a refuge. It's not a seismic refuge, folks. <laughs> And Jay Patton is right here, and he had the foresight to put a group together, a vertical reference working group, I think it was called, or something like that, to figure out is the land going up or down in our area, which is essential to know 
to figure out sea level rise vulnerability. And this is what they have come up with uh, after all sorts of painstaking measurements. And it turns out on most of the coastal areas that are on the ring of fire, there's a rapid uplift and a net uplift and steep coasts. Um, but the velociraptor in the ointment here is that that's not true of the Humboldt Bay area, which is sinking, and sinking fast. Yeah. Can you feel it? Yeah. 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 We're sinking yeah, here, and we're sinking at uh, like three to five millimeters per year, Ooh. about the same rate as global average sea level rise. Oh. And so that doubles the effective sea level rise. Oh. And this is kind of the worst yeah. situation in all of California. Oh. Yeah. So, <laughs> I know, I told you, I just got to be a part of it. I have to fulfill my... Uh, yeah. so, I know. I will try and moderate this a little bit for you. Next few slides. Basically, we're in three. It's rising. That's cool. And all the way up Crescent City, it's rising. And so it's uh, uh, moving away from sea level. And uh, ameliorating sea level, but where it's falling, it exacerbates sea level, and too bad, but that's happening around Humboldt Bay. Each of the bays. The whole, yeah. the, whole, yeah. Yeah. the whole area is sinking. You're probably okay. I'm definitely okay. I plan And then here's something else that doesn't really yeah. have to do with climate change as far as we know, but you should know this, that you can get sea level rise the kind of sea level rise that we worry about happening in 50 or 100 years, you can get that in like two minutes. Yeah. Um, because of rapid subsidence during a big earthquake. And, uh, and Lori Dengler tells me that during the big mega thrust earthquakes, subsidence is common. So you can get rise, uh, say in the big Anchorage earthquake, a lot of stuff jumped up, like, like between three and 10 meters. Um, but this was the 2011 earthquake in um, Japan, and it sank. And these areas were not full of water before the earthquake, and now they are. So be ready for a large earthquake. Uh, they do happen here. They will happen here. It might happen in the next second. Uh, <laughs> oh, good. Oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> We're here. Oh, <laughs> Fantastic. Life is good. Let's drink beer. Life is good. Yeah, yeah probably won't even happen tomorrow. Yeah, uh, probably not. even happen for the rest of your life. Next but time. you can wake up tomorrow and there's a whole new world here. And be ready for that. And you know, what's going to happen to your house and you and your family if a big mega thrust earthquake happens here uh, while you're alive? It will happen. So just wanted to kind of throw that in. We are not a seismic refuge. Uh, <laughs> Jay likes that one. Yeah. The t-shirt. I'm going to make a t-shirt. No, 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 no. <laughs> got the earth here. Yeah. Yeah. Nerd of the world. No, no. We're the seismic refuge. Yeah. We're so if you go, if you go to the east coast or the gulf coast, you have very gentle slopes on the shoreline. And you may get a foot of sea level rise and 300 feet of incursion of the water into the landscape because of that gentle slope. But if you have a steep slope, like we have in most places here, not Humble Bay, unfortunately, uh, but you have very, very much less incursion of the water into the landscape. And so having that steep coast that we have here is a benefit in terms of sea level rise. Um, but is that vulnerable? This is out on the lost coast. So that, yeah, this is vulnerable. If sea level rises, this will probably erode a lot faster. Uh, but nobody lives there, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah one guy uh, does. Yeah. Yeah, Thomas lives there. <laughs> one guy. And then sea level rise is not homogenous across the globe. You might think it's like a big bathtub. It's not. There's all sorts of heterogeneity. And we're actually seeing less global sea level rise here uh, than in a number of other places uh, because of the thymetry, salinity, um, the centrifugal effect of the earth, the uh, currents, and a whole bunch of other uh, factors. But we're a little bit better off here uh, on the west coast. 
And then uh, Alderaan has shown that um, most of the Humboldt Bay is artificial shoreline. It's dikes or roads or railroads or something like that. And many of them are already failing. Uh, they're 100 years old, give or take, and nobody's really in charge of them. They're on private land. There's no dike district uh, that kind of looks after these or looks after what happens when they fail. Uh, and they're actively failing now. So we can get a really big tide. Um, and there's a number of failure points. Uh, and I'm not going to go into detail about the impacts of sea level rise here, even though I know that's interesting to people. Um, but as I said, this has been dialed now, and there's a number of publications that are available that really show that for you. If you're interested, just go to the Harbor District website, or there's a, a Humboldt State Working Group on sea level rise, and all those publications are available. So you can pull those and see all sorts of maps about what the impact will be. But this is uh, some modeling that Jeff Anderson uh, did. Um, and this is the 100-year uh, the high water, so an especially high tide, and maybe some inflow of flush water into the, into the bay, although the bay doesn't have a big catchment area. And then one, uh, two meters of sea level rise. Uh, and then... It's red. Basically, uh, this is the, the blue is the area that with the 100 year flooding and the red is the increase that happens. Um, and so there's a special impacts in, on the shoreline of Eureka um, and the bottoms of Arcata and a number of other places. Uh, and this maybe isn't the best map to show, but basically there's a lot of stuff in the way, and especially infrastructure, uh, and roads, uh, utility lines, water lines, gas lines, uh, sewage treatment plants, um, but not a lot of people live there. And so that's a kind of a built-in resilience, is that we didn't build out our sea level rise zone. It's also the tsunami zone, actually. Yeah. It's kind of good that we didn't build there, too. But um, basically, there's a bunch of places in the world where that's not true, where it's full of people and farms and infrastructure and whatnot. And so we're maybe a little better off than a lot of places that heavily developed these coastal areas that are now so uh, susceptible to sea level rise. And this is a uh, uh, frequency diagram. This may be a little confusing to some of you, but hydrologists live and breathe for these things. Uh, and so the current 100 year a return interval uh, is this value here, which with just a half a meter of sea level rise becomes like the annual level. Uh, so the recurrence interval changes drastically, very quickly. And then when you get more sea level rise than that, um, the current 100 year level is exceeded uh, anyway. So. And then if all the ice melts, which you know, nobody knows if that's going to happen. If it does happen, it's, it's we'll all be long dead. Um, but it's not a great story for here. So, um, Wandy's is underwater. Oh. Yeah, I know. Bummer. So, have a beer while you can. Yeah. Before the Antarctic is gone. Uh, and I think the top of Founders Hall would be would be sticking out of the water. Yes. So, yeah. And then here's here's the southern end. Uh, wow. Uh, really? Wait a minute. Where are we? But that's if all the ice melts. Okay. And that could happen. You don't know. Uh, there's no uh, historic evidence of missing ice sheets, and no one at sea level is doing that. That's really reliable. And so we don't know if that's going to happen, but it could happen. We have runaway climate change, and we don't get a handle on this problem, then that is sort of the end point or the worst case situation of all the ice melts on the two giant continental ice sheets, and uh, the impact arcade is gone, basically, the sunny gray is gone. What's the elevation? What was it? What was it? 64 meters. You had it there. 64 meters. If only we could go backwards in time. 212 feet. 212 feet. Sorry it's not in meters, but... Um, it was 64 meters. 64 meters. Yeah. There we go. 
Um, but here's an interestingly good story about this. Is if we will resist the urge to just dike it off. You, you can dike off, you can live below sea level. You know, 60% uh, of the Netherlands is below sea level. Most of, uh, all of Amsterdam is at least a meter or two below sea level. Um, uh, the Dutch have figured this out, figured out how to do it. And you can do it if you have money. A lot of money. A lot of money. Um, and there is sort of a knee-jerk response of, we'll just dike this off. There's going to be a bunch of places in the world where that's what they'll have to do or they'll have to move. Um, but with Humboldt Bay, if you allow the if you allow the dikes to fail, and you don't build new dikes, the bay will occupy the footprint that it used to occupy, and you'll have a lot better habitat for fish and wildlife. Okay, the habitat increase will be quite substantial. Yeah, it's a good thing. And so you know we're reckoning that now, and with these vulnerability assessments and the press that has followed that. There's a lot of discussion in city councils and planning groups, um, in the Sea Grant uh, group, um, in, in county meetings and whatnot about sea level rise. And we're sort of reckoning what we're going to do about it. And I would strongly advocate let the bay go. Don't dike it off, except where you have to. And there will be those places where you have to. We're going to have to dike off the Arcade of Marsh, for example. Um, but otherwise, just let the bay do what it wants to do, and we'll actually have quite a benefit for fish and wildlife habitat. Uh, and if the Arcata Bottoms floods uh, from sea level rise and turns to salt water, you lose like 500 acres of pasture land, but you'll gain a whole bunch of uh, freshwater coastal wetland, which is some of the most valuable habitat there is for migratory birds, and for salmonids and for a whole host of other organisms. Uh, and so we have a choice here uh, to try to fight it, uh, and we know how to do it. Uh, and just go see the Dutch, and they'll show you how to do it. And they needed to do it, you know. Uh, but uh, if we let it go, let, let the bay go, we'll get a lot of benefit from that. And that's true in a lot of other places where you don't have a lot of infrastructure or say the Mackenzie Delta in Alaska, well, almost nobody lives there, and it's gonna grow, and you'll get better, you'll get more salmon, basically, which is cool. Thing. Uh, and just in a relative way, the sea level rise risks in the Gulf Coast and East Coast of the US, uh, and along the East Coast of, of Mexico um, and Latin America are much, much greater than they are here. And we have this humble bay problem, but overall in the Western US, is vastly less of a problem than it is in the eastern U.S. and the Gulf states. Um, and then I'm very fond of working in Vietnam. If you haven't been to Vietnam, I really recommend. It's a wonderful place to go. This is Canta, which is the uh, primary city in the Mekong Delta, at the very southern end of Vietnam. And it's a Holocene Delta, like all these other coastal features, Humble Bay, and uh, the Nile Delta and on and on, all developed in the last few thousand years during that stable sea level run period. This is what happens in Kanta every time the tide gets high. And this is not rainwater, this is water from the Mekong River that just backs up in the sewers and comes into the streets. Wow. Uh, and they just live with it, you know, no big deal. Uh, but uh, this shows you what a dire situation they're in. And, um, so I, I have a, a number of colleagues there and have been working there, and, and this is what happens uh, in the Mekong Delta with about one meter of sea level rise. This area is about 18% of Vietnam. It's about the size of two New Jerseys, um, but way over half the food, uh, half the rice and half the fish comes from here. It's this incredibly fertile area, um, and 20 million people live there. And they're on a prosperity walls, so they're building stuff all over the place as this happens. Um, it's an amazing thing. And to add to that, they have subsidence rates that are five times the rate of sea level rise uh, in a bunch of areas. Um, and what happens 
is that the groundwater turns salty. And so, um, or the surface water turns salty rather. And the groundwater turns salty later. But the surface water turns salty, and so people dig groundwater wells to still get fresh water. There's a lot of fresh water and geologic fresh water. And they pull the groundwater out, and that causes the ground to sink more. There's more subsidence, and it's a, a negative feedback loop. So you pump the groundwater, the ground drops, the salt comes in further, and you pump more groundwater. Um, and then the, the whole delta is now losing sediment. It used to be a gaining delta that was replenished by sediments. Now with the dams on the Mekong, it's losing. It doesn't have enough sediment to replenish itself. Um, the salt is coming in about 10 times further in the summertime than it used to. Uh, so it used to come in 10 kilometers from the South Sea or the South China Sea. Now it comes in 100 kilometers. And it just changes everything. Um, the Vietnamese people are very adaptable, but boy, are they going to have to adapt here. Um, and then this is the uh, salinization of surface waters. Uh, and during El Nino events, they have a reliable drought in Southeast Asia. So the water gets warm in South America, it gets cold in Southeast Asia. The Western Pacific gets cold. And that leads to a reliable drought situation. Well, they had a really bad drought uh, two years ago, and the salt came way in and was a disaster, a real crisis situation. Not just for the Mekong Delta, but for the Red River Delta and for Da Nang and Puerto Rico, a number of other cities uh, that are coastal and are subject to this impact. And the people there live right next to the water. And you can't believe that they do it, but they just kind of live with loss. They know how to adapt when uh, when they get flooded out. Um, where's this? That's the Nile River. The Nile is not just a, a river in Nile. Uh, anyway, most of the people live along the river or in the Nile Delta, and it's highly vulnerable. With one, uh, here's the sea level rise picture. Um, even half a meter of sea level rise in Alexandria is underwater. Um, and Cairo's way up at the top here, so it's okay, but this whole end of the Nile Delta is highly vulnerable to sea level rise. Um, and there's a bunch of other places. Uh, Bangladesh, there's a whole bunch of cities in India, cities in China, the Mississippi Delta, of course, on and on and on and on. This impact plays itself out all over the world. And in these low elevation, flat, recent, close to sea level areas is a place where people like to live. And it forms fertile agricultural soils and it's where the farms are. Um, and those big mega deltas of the world are where the worst impacts are. And it's almost immeasurably worse than what we're gonna face here. So it's just like, yeah, you could be in a worse situation. <laughs> you could be living in the Mekong Delta. Um, Anyway, in uh, San Francisco, the situation in San Francisco is not good. Um, I don't think they have the same kind of subsidence we do, although I don't know. Do you know, Jay? No, they don't know. Um, but they have a big, there's a Except big mega the, delta yeah, here. That's it's, subsiding. It's not a coastal mega delta, it's inland because of the way California is set up. But this whole area is highly subject to sea levels, including Sacramento. Sacramento is basically there because of the dike system. It's actually very close to sea level. Uh, and so this whole area is very uh, vulnerable. Um, more vulnerable than here in terms of the amount of area and certainly in terms of the amount of people and value affected. Um, and this happens already at high tide. This is the Marcadero in San Francisco. We're already like right up against it in San Francisco. Um, and here's an interesting thing. Most of the big tech firms are right down here in the innovation zone. So Google and you know, Facebook, uh, even, uh, even NASA is a little bit vulnerable, Cisco, Oracle, all of these big firms, basically when they went to build their big campuses, the valley was all built out, and so they went down to the mud flats and built them there. And so those places are all uh, vulnerable. And 
uh, you're probably going to see some diking. They can afford to get <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, they, they, they got money, they can move. Yeah, so Silicon Valley becomes like Amsterdam. No. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then, to, to close, I just wanted to, to mention the, the amazing sort of social capital, especially, that we have here for a gap. And I think it's the reason a lot of us like to live here, because there's, there's amazing stuff goes on here, and amazing people. And Humboldt State is here. Ah, it's fabulous. And we're rich. Now you might be thinking, well, I'm not rich. <laughs> but you are. <laughs> we live in a place where there's a lot of financial resources available when there's a public crisis. Uh, and resources in a way that you don't see in a lot of places in the world. For example, Vietnam doesn't have money like we do. Even though we're not a rich county, you know, they don't have those same kinds of resources. And there's a number of other places in the world. Bangladesh doesn't have a government that can put billions of dollars into saving people from sea level rise. India doesn't, you know, it, 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 and it goes on and on. So um, we, there's many examples, and it's a little risky to list them because there's many, many more than I've listed here, but we have the Shats Energy Research Lab, which is absolute world-class center uh, for um, energy research, and they're all over the climate change mitigation uh, situation and doing some amazing stuff. And of course, all sorts of stuff going on in HSU. Many of the tribes get it and they take progressive action. Uh, they understand this problem, they certainly don't deny it, and there's a lot of progressive action being taken around it. Um, I mentioned uh, Alderon and Jeff and their vulnerability assessments. Uh, Steve Sillett and Rianne Twan and all in their Save the Redwoods League studies of the Redwoods, uh, super important. Marie's sitting right here. Um, the Sea Grant Coastal Program, they had a, a big meeting and webinar this morning about offshore wind. Uh, Andrea Tuttle is uh, a preeminent expert in forest carbon, and she's right here in Arcata. Mm -hmm. And goes to all the uh, committee of parties meetings, and uh, is really a very big player in forest carbon, and forest carbon mitigation. Uh, Sharon Crano with H.G. Harvey and Associates is a great expert in, in offshore processes and offshore wind, and is shepherding this process along, uh, and so on. Um, we also have a lot of forest carbon sequestration going on. Um, actually, Andrea and the, um, um, oh, it's a nonprofit that she works with. Um, Pacific. Pacific. Pacific Forest Trust. Thank you. The, I have the noun hole, and I just can't pull up those proper nouns anymore. Pacific Forest <laughs> Trust. And Andrea and the Pacific Forest Trust were instrumental in getting the idea of a forest carbon offset accepted into the California cap and trade system. And, and now you can sell forest carbon, they basically rent forest carbon to the cap and trade system. Uh, and I'll just note that the cap and trade system is working in California. The whole world is watching this because we desperately need a market for carbon offsets and it's working in California. And um, a year ago, uh, forest carbon offsets were worth about $11 a ton. They're up to $15.05 a ton today. And there's expectation that when AB31 is renewed next year, it'll be up to probably $25 a ton. Uh, and so that's a huge thing, and it's working. Um, and there's a number of projects that are going on here. The city of Arcata jumped in really early and has already sold uh, from the community forest uh, over $150,000 worth of forest carbon offsets in the voluntary market. Um, the Van Eck Forest um, is, is uh, forest carbon offsets and is making a bunch of money on that. The Iraq Tribe is doing uh, forest carbon offsets. I think the Hoopa Valley Tribe is, is also doing forest carbon offsets. No, but anyway, the, the, the Yurok's are all over it. There's a big story in the New York Times about that, uh, and so on. And then, in terms of uh, forest carbon offsets, Redwood is really ideal. It's like insanely great, because it grows fast, it doesn't rot, it doesn't burn, uh, everybody loves it. Um, it's like the ideal carbon sequestration machine, you know, Coast Redwood. Um, and 
you know, a ton of forest carbon is a ton of forest carbon, exactly. but it's not really a ton of yeah. redwood forest carbon in the world. Is really yeah. great stuff. So uh, anyway, so that's working. And it's it's one of those things like who knew electric cars would be working would be so feasible already, and who knew that wind and solar panel would be the power would be so feasible already, but they are. And who knew that we'd be selling forest carbon credits? That there would be a system of cashing in on a forest without cutting it down. Super cool. Yeah, but that's working. Yeah. And it's, it's working worldwide. And then here's a, an amazing thing. It turns out this is probably the best place on the West Coast to do offshore wind power. Uh, for a variety of reasons, one of which the military won't allow it in Southern California. But, uh, but for, Go for, Army. for a bunch of reasons, this is a great place to do offshore wind power, and the projects are developing very quickly, and it's likely that we'll have an array of offshore wind turbines in the semi-near future. So it's really, really cool. And the lights in this room would be from turbines, you know, 40 miles out at sea. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and then there's a lot of things to work out before that happens, but I, I'm pretty confident that we'll work them all out. Uh, what about the view? I hope we can see him. There's fog. I hope we can see him. <laughs> so, um, let's do a review here um, of, of the good news story that, I, that I'm trying to bring you today. Um, First of all, the temperature is, is greatly moderated by our coastal proximity. The uh, precipitation is enough, and there will likely be more. Uh, the snow, uh, where there is snow, there will be less snow and more rain, uh, but we don't really need it here uh, like we need it in so many other places. Uh, tropical storms, we don't have them here. Um, fog, there will likely, likely be more fog, so more moisture and cooler. Um, the big wind storms like the Columbus Day storm, those are not expected to happen. Um, they're not, that's not coming out of the models. Um, and the, the high-end meteorologists say, we don't think this is going to happen. Um, it's likely that the redwoods will be OK. Uh, and then, of course, the yeah buts. We have sea level rise, we have flooding, we have some uh, potential for blue water droughts. Uh, and then the bigger thing is, you know, we're, we're a human family. There was a tremendous amount of uh, suffering and loss and vulnerability across the globe. And just because it's good here doesn't mean we can relax and not worry about climate change. We have a human family and there are a lot of people that are going to have it way, way worse than we do. That doesn't mean it doesn't have some damage here or it's not a negative here, but it's way, way more negative in a lot of other places. And that's the kind of relative refuge story that I wanted to tell you. And I have a, a, a Vietnamese colleague who's, who's studying in the Netherlands now, and, and she tossed this at me. Um, and you remember the uh, Think Global, Act Local? That was, a, that was a big slogan back then. Well, she said you could flip that, and it makes sense. And I won't tell you how it makes sense, but think about it. <laughs> Okay, well, thanks for your attention.